Sometimes the game I like to play is Adusa Keshyat. Who is not here? Lost quite a few. Booski is uh, down south, uh, helping a relative. So he had to depart. Akwesh Dugit is not here. Uh, Sumik is not here. Sacha is not here. X Putin sometimes joins us. Yesh Twitch is on. Yesh is not on. Kukja is not here. Hanteh, are you on the phone? Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll motor into, uh, we're going to finish up uh, this recording we are listening to yesterday. We'll move into a couple other things. Hopefully we keep you on uh, long enough. All right, so here we go. We're going to get back to, uh, this is, we'll start towards the top of page 20 and just sort of pick it up from there. Make sure everything is going the way that it should be. Share the screen. Let's go around the top of page twenty of our handout. That takes me a second to get that. I thought I had it. Ha 
They do a little bit more uh, eating in Sepulopo. Let's we'll get that part. You can read it and you'll start eating some fish. All right. It was an awful lot to get to digest. But any thoughts before we move on to talking about the web? There's a lot to sort of examine here from the learner's perspective, culturally, uh, language wise. Any reactions? One just little language thing I was wondering about, uh, uh, a lot of times you say ayas and ayus, I don't I, I think that's probably a dialect thing. Um, it'd be good to ask Shakuish uh, about it, maybe at Tuesday class. And I can ask Gloria too, because I was circling, at first I was separating, I was like, that must be a hus contraction though. That husk contraction usually only takes place when it's the object from it, not like them. So uh, it seemed, but then when I noticed he was doing it pretty much every time, then I figured it was probably the bad one. Whenever he'd say, aya, or ayu, away, uh, he would say, ayas, ayus, away. And it was, it was really neat, it's a really neat thing. Um, he gets a uh, super, super strong thing that's in here. Um, there's certainly things to go through and to continue examining with this. There are multiple people involved with the transcription and the translation. Uh, and it's a very daunting task to go through and to try to document what they're saying. Um, it's also really interesting because once the camera's on, you know, it's not a normal conversation. It's just, it's impossible. Uh, but what you see is there's a number of times where, uh, and it's interesting to think about turn taking and how it works. So, like in English, what they've sort of figured out, linguists, is when people kind of smack their lips, it, will, it means they're signaling that they would like to talk. Right? So, it's just saying, I want to talk. And then it, linguistics are really interesting because there's things like, if you think about it too much, then you're like, is it always that way, or now am I thinking about it too much? Um, and parts of it could be turn-taking in, in language, but it's all, also interesting. And trying to figure out how that works in, in Shingit. And what's also really interesting is if you get people talking, um, and especially if they're being recorded, which it, which it probably changes, um, but it probably wouldn't be much different than two people talking in front of other people. Like if you got two uh, folks who knew about plans a lot and say, talk to us about, let's talk about plans and we'll just listen. Uh, so since there's two people involved, um, what you see is there's a number of instances where Wush is sort of initiating the sort of subject matter. And then there's other cases where Kha is saying, okay, I'm going to wrap this, I'm going to wrap this part up. Now you wrap up. You know, there, there was a part where it's actually telling him, kind of saying, I'm done. You go ahead and talk, and we're going to wrap this whole project, this whole sort of conversation. Uh, but then they sort of they, they they have some different steps of, of how to do that. But they do start signaling that they want to sort of wind it down. So those kinds of things are interesting as well. They also had a, a very sort of a kind of a formal entry into the conversation, giving their names and and just sort of talking about some of the things that they were thinking about to sort of initiate the conversation. Other things you guys noticed? Yeah. Last night when I went home, I felt really happy kind of, and calm and I felt like I had a really good day. Mm -hmm. And I think it was just from listening to the trip, let's say, or listening. It felt really nice. And I thought it was 
such a good um, conversation to listen to while we met Rent Stay. Yeah, we'll pick one before the end of the semester. We'll do two women who are having a conversation as well. It's different content, different sort of modes of speech. But it's it's good to sort of just step out of the drilling and just say, let's just listen to a stretch of the thing here. So starting to think about our sort of wrap-up strategy. If we want to do one more conversation, you know, I'd like to do one probably story. Uh, maybe next week when we there's a few more of us will we'll, we'll brainstorm and I'll present some options to the stories. Uh, yeah, so it just it does it does good to listen. Uh, I'm gonna try and extract some of the audio from it, see if I can get the audio and, and put that up so you guys can download it so you can just have it with you and listen to it. Um, the video files are there as well. Sometimes it's nice just to have the audio so you can walk around and just listen to it, especially if you if you've sort of gone through it a couple times and you know what they're saying, that, that really helps your brain fill in the blanks between the two languages. Is that sometimes you do a lot of stuff back and forth, a lot of drill, 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 and every now and then you just sort of immerse yourself into a language scenario. And sometimes you get to put yourself in situations where you don't know what's being said. That way it's just sort of you're challenging yourself to try and connect the dots. But then you, you got to have this stuff that is manageable as well, so you know, even you know, as you read through this, or if you were watching the the subtitles go by in the text, then when you just listen to it again, you're going to be remembering these parts. You're going to be trying to figure out which parts are where. And the more often you do that, um, you know, because the way that grammar tends to work is you, you learn all these underlying structures and all this other stuff. But it, it'd be sort of like if you called someone on the phone. This this would be the situation even though it's really weird. If somebody called you on the phone and said, can you explain to me how to walk? And, and you know, like, like, it's a very weird situation, but if you had to physically talk somebody through how to walk, you're like, OK, well, you kind of lean on what, you know, then you'd have to think about all the different steps that you just do. And so sometimes, instead of just thinking about those steps about how to walk, you just got to sort of go somewhere where people are walking and you just got to walk around. And so part of that is making language yourself, but a big part of it is just listening to the language, and especially catching on to the fluency. And you can see sometimes, uh, and their their pacing is a little different. And, and in this conversation, um, you see Wush Jehoish really thinking carefully about what he's going to say, and having a sort of a more um, the pace is just different. You know, it's sort of delicately as far as how he's saying these certain things. And then there's certainly parts where Kajapati is, he just starts just really rolling, his mind is really going, you know, and he's 102, so he, he knew that there was a lot of things that he had to say um, in probably a short period of time. Even though he had gone a lot of places and done an awful lot of things, there wasn't a whole lot of just language documentation that involved him, so this, this project is really great. And it's, one other, there's two other videos that have him on there, and I think there's one or two others that have Mushjahuish on there. Uh, so you know, with the, the text that's there as, as well, like you guys can do yourselves an awful lot of favors of just going through these conversations and just checking them out. Uh, and then also, where, how do you make this? So it's a multi-step process, but if we just sort of, um, that's a good sort of thing to go over. So let's say we, we took a look at one of these. Uh, and let's, I'll just grab. Uh, I like that one with the Kanae baby. Is that? It's this one, right? Florence Shaker. So as you click on one of these, and then you stare at it like, okay. So once this thing opens, uh, uh, on an Apple, it's Command O. On a PC, I think it's Command A. And on a PC, it's uh, Control A. And that's going to select everything. And then Command or Control C is going to copy everything. And then you move into a. What's that? That last thing that you just brought up. I didn't even know that it oh, That's uh, Command Tab. Command to move tab. between. 
applications. And then, uh, oh, this is for fun. These were my questions I asked. I think everybody who graduates from UAS should be able to answer these questions. Because when Paul, who's Elizabeth Kratovich, how many last native languages are there? How many last native language families are there? How are last native languages grouped in the culture? So then I had a couple more about Anyways. So then, uh, so if you had a blank document, when you paste it, uh, this is what you get. Okay. And so one thing that you could do, uh, I think Word gives you the option. If you have a Mac, I don't know if you can still get it now. I don't know if it'll show up here. There's a little add-on thing. It's called unformat. It removes the formatting from documents. You should do that. You just get the straight text. Uh, it takes a little bit of maneuvering. I can't remember exactly. I think I did a line by line thing to separate it and get it from one side to the other. It might be an easier way to sort of go about that. But usually, what I would do uh, in this case, and it depends on your operating system and what versions of things you have. But if you tend to have the newest versions of things, uh, they handle some of the underlines a little bit better. There's a Is that where they capitalized all the Gs? Yeah. So going through and thinking about how we document clinking. Oh, I think we actually have a tab bar between all of these. So. Oh, this play annotation. Oh, wow. It's on every single one. Yeah. Which you could copy that, find, and if you enter um, and you, you paste it, and you don't put anything under the replace, when you hit replace all, they all go away. You're so sneaky. I didn't even know you. So now you, you know all this. the tricks. And um, <laughs> and you can actually, now that these are all, well, it take a little bit of work, but you can convert it to a table, and then you just start dragging yeah, some dragging over one at a time. It's a bit of a labor process. But when you're working with the Elon files, and I might work with Alice and see if she'll help us with this, uh, you can export it much faster. You can do what's called the tab to the ex export, and then you convert it to a table. Uh, and if the, t the tabs it treats as a column, the enter it treats as a row. So then it would just do it all by itself. It tends to go pretty fast that way. Um, yeah, so the, the other thing to pay attention to here is the, the capital G, uh, there was a time when what happened is you'd have the underline would smash into the scoop of the G, and it would, it would disappear sometimes. Uh, and so sometimes we were trying to find a font that was just perfect. There'd be a little circle under the, come down with a little circle, and then inside the circle you can see the underline. Uh, we had never figured out what to do. There are programs like InDesign where you can get in and you can actually control where the underline goes for some kind of a different type of underline that goes far beneath the character. Uh, but the newer sort of operating systems and versions, uh, you can type these characters and they pop up the way that they should look. If you have a Mac, there's a keyboard called the Crippen keyboard, which I need to, I'll update some of the files and put on cricket.info so you can download and install that keyboard. So if you hit if you hold down the command key, you can type accented vowels, and then you can also type underline X, underline G, oops, underline K. And then say on the way I typed uh, The other thing about it is you could do a root marker, which we use to signify the roots in the verb. And you can also do a zero marker if you want to type some new bag characters as the end of the tilde over it. Uh, you could do the gamma. You could do the downward thing to type inland clink it, the the barred L. You could do I wonder if this is what they do. Well, what's do, the difference between a barred L and that? So this they use the barred L in the inland writing system. So for example, let's say uh, 
Um, if you go to the inland, they might write this R L U K S H I Y. A with the caret marker over it. And that's what it looks like in the inlet writing system. So with the curving keyboard, you can do both writing systems, uh, and you can also type the number. Uh, so it's a pretty handy keyboard to hand. The other thing that you could do if you're doing a lot of work in, in Clinkit or Haida or uh, Simshian is there's a program called Pop Car which is, it, it stays right up here in the top left, and when you press it, this, this window pops up, and you can insert these characters. So if you were to type the word, the letter X, then you can insert what's called a combining low line, and it makes it a number. And that's actually, uh, in, in a lot of word processing programs, I will now treat that as one solid letter. Uh, but it ends, uh, in design and some other more sort of oh, you have to move them separately? technical, yeah, we'll treat it. Because it's, it's technically a, another character that puts the underline behind it. But it does, so when you type in G, it puts the underline underneath it. So one of the problems was how do we take care of this so that people can see that it's an underlying G. Um, and at the time that this project was happening, they were using uh, the capital G and sometimes you'd see it as, so this word here, shaksha uh, you might see it in any one of these forms. You might see it as a regular G like this, or you might see it uh, the other way you might see it is with a, a G that is then made into Small apps. Oh, and that's just what And so it, it ends up looking kind of silly. And so there are some people who really study a lot of fonts and, and how things should look, trying to get a really good, clean look. If you Google Grill font or Charisse, S I L, and C H A R I S, it has a lot of these different characters because there are certain fonts that just like if we change this to a font uh, like Adobe, like it, it's gonna, it just gets crazy. Like it still is there, but then nothing looks the same. Your special characters would look like they're some totally different font. And so one of the things is you're trying to create a clean, uniform look, so it's easy to read. Um, that's one of the ideas here. But Brill is a pretty clean font I found, and then. Uh, as far as natural fonts, Cambria tends to work really well because it, it tends to use a lot of mathematical formulas and other things. It's just geared a little bit more towards language learning. The Times New Roman Historic has not been good. The newer versions are pretty good. Garamond and some other fonts aren't, aren't that good. But not very options. Helvetica is a pretty good um, sans serif font if you want to sort of get into fonts. Any other thoughts, questions? Maybe you want to go over sidetrack there as well. You know what he was talking about? Uh, conjunctive. I mean, you'd say, hey, poof. That's not uh, a book that was written and thinking about poofies. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a piece of paper. I've got that paper. I don't, I don't know. The version I have wasn't written in quick. So I don't know if there is a version that was written in Clinkit. I think it, it contains a lot of Clinkit, and I'll bring that for you guys. Uh, we were, Pui was brought up in one of our classes, I think a couple years ago. Yo G was there, Irene Lamprey, and I think she's the one who brought it in for us. And then there was another one, I think, by Agnes Bellinger's. I'll bring those, I'll bring them in. Because they talk about how to run a cookie and how to the order that things should go in. So there's no other questions or thoughts. Move into our and now we've got sunshine in Juno. 
move into our weather section. Um, we'll get back to doing some, some drills. We'll do some more of this next week. I mean, tomorrow or next week. Mm -hmm. Oops. I just have one question. Yeah. On page 24, there's this word, the Gukhile, um, to make. Yeah. And um, I, I think that was one of the verbs I chose for our list. Mm -hmm. So I was for a to construct something that's really concrete, or could it also be something that's solid? It, it means to make make things as well. So you would say, um, he's going to make a house. He's going to build a house. Uh, you could say, um, but it could also just be to, to make something occur as well. And this is the verb you, you could say, he's gonna he's going to make language. He's going to speak. Uh, so it's used metaphorically as well. It's, it's future mode of it. So he or she is going to make it, usually. Uh, and it's also used sometimes, people would say to some of their language teachers, um, like I, I, I would say to Nora, and I, I said it to Richard as well, I said, you guys made me. Right. And so it's used that way as well to say, you know, you've shaped me into what I am. All right, way of time. So get back into our drill mode. Uh, we want to take a look at this. So just starting off, uh, fittingly, the weather has shifted. Now we're going to start paying attention to what these what these verbs are doing as well. So the, the terms that we should, we're going to become familiar with are imperfective, perfective, future. Those are the three ways we're going to start looking at verbs. And in Clinkit, there's a whole bunch of different verb modes. The verb changes pretty dramatically to you know the different mode. And it's just it's just different than English. English uses a lot of words around the verb to start changing the way the verb functions. There's a couple there's a few different suffixes, uh, but most of it is just taken care of with a bunch of words around. Uh, and then we, we keep in mind that time generally works different in Clinkit. Um, there's nothing magical about that statement. It's just saying the perspective of time is different. Uh, so what we find is the event is more important than the time of the event. So in English, we would say past, present, future. And in Clinkit, we'd say perfective, imperfective, future. And so the ones that change are past and present tense. So past tense in English means it happened at some point before now. Perfective means the verb has occurred. So when you get a lot of, um, there's a lot of verbs that we'll find that can be a present tense sort of verb, but it's using a perfective mode. For example, chwasiku. In Clinkit, you can't say that unless it's already happened. Right? I know. And you can't know unless you know. And that's just how it functions. It sort of looks at things from the event perspective rather than the time perspective. Uh, and so this is, and whether it's an interesting case, it tends to be pretty straightforward because it's like this now. Uh, there are a couple things, like when we get to raining, you say, you say, the verb itself doesn't change. This created some confusion for some people who first did work with Clinkit. Because someone came to me one time and said, hey, you know, I read that Clinkit doesn't conjugate verb. It must be really easy. Yeah, so, uh, I don't know where you got that from. But it could be, you know, somebody heard, how's it? How do you say it's raining yesterday? And like, oh, it's exactly the same. Cool. Then it's always the same. And that's absolutely not the case. But the case is, you know, if you're going to say it's raining, then it must have already happened. Which, which was interesting. It's interesting just the way you start thinking about these verbs. Okay. So we remember wasaiti, how you do. Um, tomorrow we'll go through a handout too. So we've got a more complete, a fairly complete list of 
answers to how you do it. Um, although, uh, I think I forgot one on here, which I will we'll have to add, which is I'm lazy. You should know how to say it. Out of respect for how to say it. Does everybody repeat? Wasakuwati. 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 So there's this thing like in English, there's a spelling system and there's a sound system, and they're not necessarily linked together, right? So if they were, you wouldn't have the letter C. You just have CH, right? So why would you ever need C? Uh, you also wouldn't have the O U G H combo, which actually there's a fun thing in here. There's a couple of lines if you notice. I did this sort of global search and replace, and I changed G H. Let's see, I went through the Clinket and I changed capital G to a G H, and then I changed the G H to the new underlying G. I can't remember why I went through that process. There's some reason why I had to go through this multi-step process. Uh, but what I forgot is that there's a GH combination in English. So if it said though, it would say thou. Now that's what it says. It says an underlying G. They're fucking instead of fighting. Right? So it's, it's pretty fun. Um, but it, what, the reason we're talking about this is because we're going to start talking about what's, what's going on in this little box here. So with this beginning clinket handout, what it's intended to do it's trying to use a lot of images instead of uh, words. So instead of saying Raven, yay, Raven, yay, and you just look at that picture, say so that's yay. Uh, so you can think of my little daughter Ava. Whenever she sees a bird, she goes yay. That's that's her name for every single bird on the earth. And then she goes, <laughs> and that's because she she can't quite go ha ha. Yes, they go. But when we get to the phrases, so this is how we would write it. And then this is saying, you know, the translation of that. And I try to be fairly close with the translation. So instead of saying, what is your name, it says, how are you called? Just so we're starting to think about how the language kind of functions. Then here, there is a process. Uh, so we're looking at a box, and then the box to the, to the right, and it's kind of split. And underneath it, this is a box that's starting to sort of break the language apart. And look under the hood and say, this is what we're really looking at. So this is where it would write uh, the letter Y as the GIN, Y the two dots over it. Uh, and the reason we write that is because that will be a yuck sound. But if there's an, a U or a double O before it, so everybody go, oh. Ooh. And ooh. ooh. You see how far your lips have to go out to make that sound? Ooh. That's called rounding of the lips. And one of the things with clinket is if your lips go out there, for certain sounds, they'll just stay there. So yeah and wah are really close sounds. So everybody go yeah, yeah, wah, yeah, wah. They're very similar sounds, except you're going yeah and wah. It's position of the lips. So what happens is if you get this rounded sound, it turns into a double. A double. And so that's why yati becomes kuwati. And it's, it's good to make note of that, because there's a, there's a thing that pops up as a W all the time, which is the perfected mark, sort of like the ED marker uh, in English. But it's not marking time. It's marking completion of an event. So what we have here is, this is what we call segmenting, just sort of, here's the actual pieces that make up this little frame. And then this says, uh, this is a gloss, which is saying, here's a coding of all of these different things, either what it means or what we call it, classifiers. So we get a little bit more complicated as we go along and get up towards that clink of linguistics. And then this is a literal sort of translation that trying to treat the word order the same and also the, what the verb is doing. But this is how you would translate. So we, we know yuck a is another verb we've learned. So now we'd say So to sort of 
you know, we haven't been very interactive today, but uh, I'll ask, what's up, Kuwati? What's up, Kuwati? And you'll respond, Kuwake. What's up, Kuwati? Kuwake. What's up, Kuwati? Kuwake. What's up, Kuwati? Kuwake. What's up, Kuwati? Kuwake. If to Chita, what's up, Kuwati? Kuwake. Shugesh, what's up, Kuwati? Kuwake. Even in Fairbanks? Okay, <laughs> what's are you still there? I know she had a little batteries. Shuatina. Oh, Shuatin, what's up, Kuwati? Kuwake. Okay, Miss Cheesh. Anybody else on the phone? So moving down. Now is anybody else on the phone? I was trying to get it off you and I haven't. Oh, okay. Uh, what's up, Kuwati? Kuwake. So this is our first verb uh, that's perfective. And it's perfective. You know, if it's sunshining, it must have already, even if it's happening right now, it must have already happened in order for us to talk about it. This is the way it works. So what gives it away is the W right here. So instead of ya, we get ow. And so we get the sound ow at the front. Ow de gone. Ow de gone. Ow de gone. And this is actually the way we would actually write it. Um, we're gonna change it. It'd be like this. Update this. Oops, that's not right. And the perfective marker is something that pops up in a certain spot in the verb. It'll usually look like a W, or sometimes, uh, like, and we'll see what it does to some of these other things. But it depends on what's going on here. As we start to think about how the verb works, uh, we get there's a there's a root here. There's a classifier, which is dip. And then we get into the area we're going backwards. Root, classifier, subject, perfective, object. In between, to the left of that perfective marker, we also might have some other thematic type things, which we'll look at. Oh. Everybody say, oh. 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 There are three of those things in clinking verbs. And they're unfortunately identically sounding, and they appear in pretty much the same spot. So there's puff, like, what's up, Kuwati? You could technically be saying, how are people doing? Because there's a there's an object pronoun, ka. But you say, what's up, ka, yeti? How are people? Which is a really weird thing to ask. I don't know why you ask. Um, but there are cases like, kusaka, eating people. Right? And that's like a cannibal, a cannibal. Um, and so we'll start looking at that. Uh, but for now, for these weather verbs, when you say it's cloudy, you don't mean people are cloudy. You mean weather is cloudy. And there's a third one which has to do with relating to a space. Um, for now, last one, I'll ask you again, what's up, Kowati? And your answer now will be, how did gone? Uh, and it's related to a verb. Uh, gone means to burn, for something to burn or to be lit. Yes, I'll be gone. <laughs> oh, Ishan. Pante, what's up, Kuwati? I'll be gone. Shubuti, what's up, Kuwati? I'll be gone. You came. So I'll keep it long and low, though. I'll be gone. I'll be gone. When we get to verbs, it's going to make the vowel length and tone. It's a big difference because it's going to change in predictable a little bit complicated ways. All right, Mr. Cheesh, we'll see you guys.
Mushikach 217 Sekhanen. Enjoy the sunshine or the non sunshine. Goodness, teeth. Like frosty on 